Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our presenter this evening is the Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Undergraduate Theology at Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. A Jewish convert to Catholicism, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow teaches a wide range of courses, including the theology of Pope Benedict XVI, apologetics, the Eucharist, and the theology of the Old Testament. Dr. Morrow earned both his MA and PhD in theology from the University of Dayton and specializes in the history of modern biblical interpretation. He has presented more than 40 scholarly presentations before academic gatherings. He has published more than 100 articles, book chapters, entries and reference works, and book reviews, and is the author of Three Skeptics in the Bible, Catholic Apologetics Resources, and Jesus' Resurrection, A Jewish Convert Examines the Evidence. It's a pleasure to have with us this evening my friend, my good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Moore. Jeff. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, this opportunity to talk about what I enjoy talking about the most, the history of modern Biblical interpretation. So this is entitled Deconstructing the Bible, Understanding the Crisis in Biblical Interpretation. And over these three webinars, what I hope to do is, is it rather ambitious. We'll see if we're able to cover all this ground. But I want to start with talking about uh, how Pope Benedict XVI identified a crisis in, in biblical interpretation in our times. I want to walk through some of the early stages of that back in the 14th century. And then if, I, if we can, over the course of these three webinars, move it into the 20th century. So it's rather ambitious. Um, there's, a, there's a book I, I want to highly recommend to everybody. I don't know if you, some of you have probably read this already. Politicizing the Bible, the Roots of Historical Criticism and the Secularization of Scripture, 1300 to 1700. Okay, this is co-authored by Scott Hahn and Benjamin Weicker. Right, this will be the main text for the course, if you will, the main text for the, uh, the, uh, the, the web webinar. Uh, Dr. Hahn and I are, are currently working on a, a sequel of sorts, taking that from 1700 to about 1900. Uh, and then i am also done a lot of work on um, bringing that into the 20th century. So we'll be covering a lot of that same territory uh, throughout these webinars. But I want to start with this kind of basic notion of, well, what's the point of Scripture? What is the point of biblical interpretation? And I'm going to go back to 2 Timothy 3.16. It's a verse we're all familiar with. Okay, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But St. Paul goes on in verse 17 to say why. So that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work, right? Scripture is inspired by God. We know that. But the purpose is so that we could be equipped for every good work. It's so that we will become saints. So Scripture is ordered, it's oriented toward our sanctification, right? Our, our divinization, our deification, our becoming other Christs in the world. That's the point. And so its main home is in the liturgy. At the liturgy, as we celebrate at every, every Eucharist, every day or every Sunday, the scripture readings prepare us for our reception of the sacraments. It's very important. And then when we receive the sacraments in the context of the liturgy, we're actually living out the salvation history that we see in scripture right here and now. And it is ordered to our living out charity in our lives, right, so that we can all achieve the perfection of charity, whether we're married, whether we're priests, whether we're priests and married, right? Um, whatever our state in life is, whatever our vocation is, we're called to become saints. It's an impossible task, but God tells us we can do it because 
He wants to do it through us. That's the point. So when we get our biblical interpretation wrong, that's really a problem. So I don't have to tell you, most of you know, you know, we send our children off, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends. They go off to college, Catholic universities. And it's become a quite common experience when they return home and they become skeptical of the tradition of the Catholic faith of the scriptures. And we think to ourselves, how did this happen? I sent my child off to a Catholic university. Maybe it happened at a Catholic high school. How did this happen? That they're going to a Catholic institution of higher learning. They're studying scripture from Catholic biblical scholars, perhaps Catholic priests. And they're leaving with a distrust of the Bible which is a real problem because we need to use the scriptures to help figure out what God wants me to do now in my life. This is supposed to be an encounter with God. In 1988, the then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, he gave a famous lecture. It's called the Erasmus Lecture. It was entitled Biblical Interpretation in Crisis. And what he did was he identified a few problems that he saw in modern biblical interpretation. This is across the world of biblical scholars. It's not only among Catholic biblical scholars, but it's there as well in the church. And what he identified were a few things. Number one, modern biblical interpretation is often taught as if it is completely neutral and objective, as if the scholars engaging in this interpretation they have no biases. They have no vested interest in any theology or the text of Scripture itself. They're trying to do a scientific biblical interpretation. Okay? And Pope Benedict wants to show some of the problems with that. One of the problems is that it starts from a position of skepticism. Doubt the Scripture unless the Bible can prove itself true. Okay? So that's one of the problems. So his response to this was fourfold. <clears throat> the first was such an, um, a neutral, objective approach to Scripture is impossible. It can't be done. That's the first. The second is love, right, our investment in Scripture, our love of God, of the church, of theology of Scripture, that does not impede our knowledge of Scripture, our understanding. Actually, it helps it. So the scholar who has no concern for the Bible or for the church is not going to get a better perspective on what the Bible is trying to tell us than somebody who is in love with God and in love with his word. Rather, the position of, of one of investment. I'm invested in this. This is the love of my life. This is about the love of my life, God has a better understanding of those things. I mean, you can think about this in terms of a marriage relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who's going to know my wife better, right? My neighbor, somebody who sees her, or myself, right? Who, who loves, I love my wife, right? Or you can think about this in the terms of your children. Who knows your children better? You, right? Or a teacher at school. There's some things a teacher at school might know better about my, my children than I do, but I know my children better. Does that make sense? It's the same with Scripture. There might be things, and there are, that biblical scholars, even skeptical biblical scholars, know about the Bible better than I do, better than you do, better than your average Catholic does. But there's a good chance that you know the Bible better, if that makes any sense. It has a claim on your life. I have a, I have a dear friend who's a Bible scholar. I won't say his name. He's a skeptic. He's an agnostic. He reads the New Testament in Greek every day. He's been doing this for about 30 years. But it has no claim on his life. Okay? So that's something that's important that Pope Benedict brings up. The third point he brings up is that a merely historical interpretation of the Bible puts the Bible back in the past as a dead, ancient book. Again, with no claim on my life. It's not the kind of place I want to look for how should I behave? What is God asking of me now? Well, we can't interrogate ancient dead historical texts in that way. That's a problem. The fourth thing he emphasized was that biblical interpretations are never without a philosophy. 
they're never without a starting point. They're never completely neutral or formal. In his 2010 post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Verbum Domini, this is what the Holy Father, then Pope Benedict XVI, wrote. And this is in paragraph 35. He wrote this. The lack of a hermeneutic, a hermeneutic is a fancy term for a method of interpretation. He says the lack of a hermeneutic of faith with regard to scripture entails more than a simple absence. In its place, there inevitably enters another hermeneutic, right? Another method of interpretation. A positivistic and secularized hermeneutic, ultimately based on the conviction that the divine does not intervene in human history. The divine does not intervene in human history. That's the starting assumption of most of these skeptical, secularized forms of modern biblical criticism. Now, why are these being taught at Catholic institutions? Well, the reason they're being taught at Catholic institutions is because Catholic scholars tend to assume that the methods themselves are neutral. The methods are not the problem. It's the interpreter. So if I believe in God, if I'm a, a Catholic priest or a Catholic biblical scholar or both, and I use these methods that scientists, scholars have developed over the centuries, as long as I start with a position of faith, that'll be fine. And the problem is, um, as we'll talk about in these next several webinars, is that some of these methods carry within them a predisposition for an atheist or an agnostic or a skeptical position. They are hardwired to lead the interpreter to the conclusion that, you know, God does not or did not intervene in human history. Maybe some of the miracles are true, the big ones, but the other ones probably not true. And that's one of the things that Pope Benedict is so concerned with, is that Catholics, by and large, have adopted the methods used and, and, and formed by skeptics that tended to be anti-Catholic, and they were using these methods against the church. And now they've come into the church as if they were good methods to be used. And some of them can be useful, so I want to, I want to say that. As we walk through this history, I want you to keep in mind, <clears throat> these are not good guys and bad guys. Okay? I think when we do apologetics, when we talk about um, sharing the faith with others, we too often think in terms of, you know, well, I'm the good guy and that's the bad guy. Well, really, as St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Ephesians, right, our battle is not of this world. Right? The humans involved, the scholars, the, the skeptics, the faithful, they're not the bad guys. These are, we're the battleground, right? The battle is over our souls. And, and the battle, again, is with the angels and with the demons. So there's a whole other world there that we don't see that's going on behind the scenes. And so what a lot of the figures we're going to cover are doing are, in many cases at least, maybe not all of them, maybe not Machiavelli as we'll see, uh, but in many cases, fairly sincere, I think. They're really trying to do the, what they think is the right thing. I think they go wrong, but they're trying to do the right thing. Martin Luther is a great example. I think he was very sincere. And we'll see how that plays out. So after Pope Benedict delivered this lecture in 1988, as Cardinal Ratzinger, there was a conversation that took place afterwards. And what he said is, he said, this is what we need. He said, if the traditional forms of interpretation that we see among the early church fathers, the great medieval theologians like St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas, let's call that method A. That's method A of interpretation. And the modern methods that use you know, modern forms of mainly historical interpretation, we'll call that method B. Well, we can't just go back to method A, right? But we know that just using method B is a problem. So what we need is a method C that takes the best of both of those methods, all right? Starting from a position of faith, a position of trust in the teachings of the magisterium, a position of trust in the scripture, right? And we take the Bible as the starting point, okay? And he says that's what we need to do. And I, I, I'll be honest, I think that's what he tried to do 
in his three volumes of Jesus of Nazareth. I think Pope Benedict was trying to do exactly what he articulated. We're going to take the, the traditional methods that the church fathers used to make the scriptures alive and relevant for us. We're going to use the modern findings of modern biblical interpretation, and we're going to read them in light of the church's tradition. And I think that's very important for all of us to think about. And so what he called for was a criticism of criticism. That is, an investigation of modern biblical criticism. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about one aspect of that, and that is the history of the development of this tradition over approximately 600 years. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is move from the 14th century with the work of Marsilius of Padua and William of Ockham. And if we can get to the English Reformation after the break, you know, that would be great. If we can't get to the English Reformation, we can continue. It's a lot to cover, right? It's, it's a lot of uh, lot to cover. Um, what I do want to mention is a couple things that are going to be going on. It just kind of give us a bird's eye view as we talk about this. A couple things are going to be going on. So the church traditionally talks about two senses, right, two levels of reading the biblical text, the literal and the spiritual, all right? And they divide them up, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, if you look at what biblical interpreters were doing in the early centuries, among Jews and among Christians as well, what you see is they're doing a lot more than just the, you know, the two senses or the fourfold senses. They're doing a lot of different things. What St. Augustine did in his book uh, on Christian doctrine, De Doctrina Christiani, is he, he kind of streamlined some of the best practices, if you will, the most faithful practices um, that he actually got from a heretic, Donatus. He was a uh, Donatus heretic, Tychonius, Tychonius' rule. Um, but, but this is a great example of St. Augustine using what's good among the bad, among the heretics. He's able to find well, what's usable here, and he found some great stuff. And probably this comes to its greatest expression in the work of St. Thomas Aquinas. And we see this articulated very well in his Summa Theologiae, where he describes the two senses of Scripture. And then he says, the spiritual sense is grounded in the literal. Okay, that's very important. The literal sense is always very important because what you're trying to figure out in the literal sense is, well, what is the sense of the text? What do the words mean? What's going on here at a base level? So important was this for St. Thomas Aquinas that he did a commentary on Job, which I'm actually working through right now on my own uh, for the first time. And it's a completely literal commentary on Job. He even says, I don't need to do a spiritual commentary on Job. Pope St. Gregory the Great already did that. It's wonderful. So he's doing a literal commentary on Job. He did a literal commentary on Isaiah. There's a lot that we can, we can learn about for our spiritual lives just at the literal level alone. And that's also very important and much neglected, I think. I mean, I'm learning a lot, but from my own spiritual life, just from reading his literal commentary on Job, St. Augustine did a literal commentary in the book of Genesis. Very brilliant work. There's a lot that can be done there. And then what Thomas Aquinas does beyond that is he says, when we look at the spiritual sense, we can divide that further into three. Okay? The first level is often called typology or allegory. And how this is typically used is where we see the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus, the church, the sacraments. He goes beyond. Then there's the moral level, or the tropological level, a more fancy term. And that level is how we learn to live rightly. Right? We learn from Scripture how to better our lives, how to live more justly how to live the charity God is calling us to live. He infused it in us in baptism, where we love God because he's God, and we love neighbor because, because of God. And we have to allow that to grow, right, through our reception of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and confession frequently, and also through our acts of charity, right, through putting this into practice. So tropology is very important, the moral, the moral sense. And the third one is the anagogical sense. And the idea there is that we read scripture so that it orients us towards heaven. Now, these senses are pretty much destroyed in the modern period by modern biblical criticism. They don't have to be, but they tend to be. All right? That was already done at the Reformation in many ways, as we'll see. And that's, that's devastating because these senses are there to help us know God better, love God better, 
and love others better. That's why they exist. And that's why they're there. They're not made up. Thomas Aquinas didn't make these up. The, the Donatist heretic Tychonius didn't make them up. Right? They're there because God willed them to be a way in which we can understand Scripture at these multiple levels to help us. Right? Because the Bible is there for us. That's why it's there. That's why it exists. So that's pretty important. Um, the next thing I want to say is, is that, and this is an insight that Pope Benedict has, is if you look at those fourfold senses of Scripture, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right, its four parts relate, and this is, again, very important when we think about biblical interpretation. The first part about the creed is basically corresponds to the literal sense of Scripture, the truths of faith. Right, the second part on the liturgy and the sacraments, right, the celebration of the Christian mysteries, well, that applies a typology which points us forward towards how the sacraments are prefigured in the old. The third portion on the moral life, right, again, the moral sense of Scripture. And the fourth portion on, on contemplating heavenly realities relates to our life of prayer. So all of these relate. They all are important for relating to our lives as Catholics. So what happens then in the modern period, all right? And this is, I would say to any scholars who are out there listening to this and thinking about this, is it's not simply that modern biblical interpretation takes historical positions, right? What happens is they, they start from a position of, of skepticism. Well, this probably, I know the tradition says this, but that's probably not true, okay? Probably what happened was this. I know that the text says that this is exactly what Jesus did and where he went and what he said and where he was born, but that's probably not true. That's probably just added in. And what ends up happening is it, it sows a skepticism toward the faith, and that's dangerous. And even if, if someone were to say, well, I, okay, we, we have to believe by faith, right, that, that Our Lady was a virgin and that, you know, there's a virgin birth of Jesus, but historically that's just not, that's not possible. But I believe it by faith. What you start to have is you have a disunity, okay? And you find this a lot among Catholic scholars now. Uh, you find this among a lot of Protestant scholars historically. And what ends up happening is there's a disunity of faith. Here's what I believe by faith. Here's what is probably true by reason and history. And they don't meet, right? It's a famous Jewish scholar uh, who's still alive, so I'm not going to name him either. But he... Uh, he talks about this because he doesn't believe there was ever a biblical Israel until very late in its, in its period. He doesn't believe there was an exodus, there was no Passover in it initially, and yet he celebrates Passover with his family. And so he was asked about this. Well, how do you do this? He said, well, I know there was no Passover, there was no exodus, God never liberated his people, God doesn't really enter into history, but this is a family tradition that I have, and this is what I celebrate. And this is what ends up happening for us, I think, when we separate faith and reason this way the way that modern biblical interpretation often does. And when we do that, what ends up happening is our faith goes by the wayside, and it doesn't impact our lives. We start to see ourselves living in a way that we're not proud of, and that's important. Or that's important to kind of keep in mind. The other place this plays uh, a role is at on television channels, History Channel, right, uh, the classroom. We get to see all the, the talking heads, the skeptics, the scholars who know Hebrew and Greek, and therefore they can proclaim what actually happened, right? There's the Jesus of faith, which we hear about on Sundays, uh, and then there's the Jesus of history. Right? Actually, the, the phrase is the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history. And as Pope Benedict mentioned at the beginning of Jesus of Nazareth, Volume 1, for him and for us, it's the same Jesus. The Jesus of history is the Jesus of faith. Rather, the Jesus of faith is the Jesus of history. Right? The figure we encounter in the Gospels is the most historically plausible on historical grounds. But sometimes it takes the eyes of faith to recognize that on rational and historical grounds, it makes the most sense, not just the position, not just the faithful position. So that's kind of, that's important. All right. And before we transition to the history, I want to do one last, one last point. And that is that, what a lot of the skepticism you hear about historically amounts to is the absence of evidence. Okay, the absence of evidence. This is pretty important because, again, just listen to the channels. Just listen to the history channels. Listen to the scholars speak. We don't see this in the archaeological record. The Bible says this. I don't see that outside of the Bible. I would argue, first of all, that the biblical account 
is historical. The biblical account is historical. And so we do have a historical record of it in the scriptures. And sometimes we have multiple accounts in the scriptures, in books written by different authors. But there's, a, there's another problem with the argument that we don't see it, therefore it didn't happen. Okay, And that is, that is this. That the archaeological record, the historical record, is fragmentary. Right? Just think about this. Texts, documents, they dissolve. They get burned. They get destroyed. Earlier I had a coffee spill and it destroyed a book as well as uh, it was my, my two-year-old came up and knocked the coffee over and it destroyed papers. It destroyed a lot of stuff, right? Um, so documents dissolve, bones dissolve, people, things get destroyed. Of all that existed once, only a fraction or a fragment of that still exists today. Much of it's destroyed. Of that fraction or fragment, right, that is buried in, in archaeological sites, those locations. Well, only a fragment of those locations have been discovered. How do we know? Because we know of a lot of different locations that we haven't identified yet. We haven't found them yet. We know them from multiple sources, not just from the Bible, but from the ancient Assyrians and Babylonians and other ancient Near Eastern civilizations. We know these places existed. We just haven't discovered them yet. Every 10 years, we're discovering more and more locations. Of those locations that once existed, that we've discovered, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, only a fraction of those sites, those locations, have actually been excavated. All right? In some cases, like Jerusalem, people are still living there. You can't just dig under their homes. right? So only a fragment has been ex explored by scholars. Of the material that has been found, only a fragment has actually been read by scholars. So uh, the, the case I always use in, in the classroom is the cuneiform tablets that are written in, in cuneiform script. So it's the, in the Akkadian language, in the Sumerian language, in the Hittite language, in the Ugaritic, and these ancient languages with this kind of wedge-shaped writing. You may not know this, but we actually have discovered hundreds of thousands of these cuneiform tablets. About 25,000 have actually been read by scholars, let alone published, not published, but read by scholars. So there's only a fragment of that material, a small fragment, that's actually been examined by scholars. Of what has been examined by scholars, a small fragment has been published and made, made available to other scholars to look at and read. It's a very slow process. It could take three, four years, um, to get published, let alone, you know, writing a project, etc. Of what gets published that's available to the scholars, only a fragment of that, if it's, if it's interesting, right, to common people, will be made known, right, to a wider audience. So really what we're dealing with is a fragment of 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 what once existed. In light of such the, of the fragmentary nature of the archaeological record, Absence of evidence can never be equated with the positive evidence of absence. You can never say, well, we don't know, we don't have evidence of it, therefore it didn't happen. You can never do that because we don't know, right? We just, we just simply don't know. And that's one of the fundamental problems, I think, with a lot of the modern biblical interpretation that goes around inside and outside of the classrooms and on the television shows that influence our family, our friends, those we care about most. Okay, and that's important. All right, so setting the stage at the beginning here, I want to talk about first period. And the first period we're going to talk about is the 14th century, the end of the medieval period, kind of the, we might want to, it might be a little early for the early modern period, but it's just getting into that. It's the late medieval period. All right, the two figures I want to talk about are Marsilius of Padua and William of Ockham. Okay. Now, Marsilius of Padua was born in 1275, and he died in 1342. He was uh, very well educated. He was educated at the University of Padua in Italy, uh, and he studied medicine, among other things. Now, there's a prior figure that I need to bring up um, when we're discussing this, and that is this Muslim philosopher, this medieval Muslim philosopher, Ibn Rushd, more popularly known as Averroes. Right? Averroes was from 1126 to 1198. So he's a little bit earlier 
uh, than Marsilius and William Bachman by about 100 years, a little bit earlier. He's important, not so much for his philosophy, but the way in which the Latin Christian world received his philosophy, all right? And the way they received him, or at least the way he's usually caricatured, is that he would speak of a double truth, okay? The idea that, well, there's the truth of, the, you know, the text for kind of common people to understand, and then there's a higher truth that the philosophers alone would understand. Now, when I talk to um, scholars of Averroes, what they'll usually say uh, pretty consistently is that doesn't get Averroes, you know, right. That's not really what he was doing. And, you know, that's, prob that's possibly true. I don't know him as well as they do, so maybe he wasn't. But that certainly is how he is, his philosophy was used in the Latin, in the Christian Latin West. Right? Now, why were Christians in the Latin West in the medieval period reading of Averroes? Well, they were reading him because he was the most popular commentator and a very famous philosopher I'm sure you've all heard of, Aristotle. Right? In fact, in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, he calls uh, Averroes the commentator. He doesn't, he doesn't use him a whole lot because he's not that useful. But he uses him, as did others, Precisely because much of Aristotle's commentaries were preserved in the Latin West by Muslim philosophers. And Averroes was the most common uh, text commentary of Aristotle that was circulating at that time. And that was a real problem because the way it was being used was this idea of this double sense of truth, where there might be this kind of religious truth that common folk have to kind of follow, kind of keep them in line. But really, the, the absolute ultimate truth is only known to the specialists, right, for Averroes or for the way he was used, that is the philosophers. We're going to see this come up again and again with Machiavelli. We're going to see this with Spinoza. We're going to see this, we probably won't talk much about John Toland and the English deists, but it, it's, it comes up again there as well. And there's a way in which we hear about this now in the modern universities, that that people of faith who read the Bible as if it's a word of God, they're operating at a low level. They're taking as true what's really a human product that's really a product of mythology. And we scholars, right, who study Greek, who have the letters PhD after our name, we know the true truth. We know the ultimate level. But we better be careful in how we share that with others because we recognize that this might erode morality among the masses. And again, this is the concern of people later like uh, Machiavelli and Toland and actually Sigmund Freud in the 20th century. You know, religious people, if that's going to keep them moral, let them be religious because, you know, we don't, we don't want them to go kill each other. I, I don't want to be robbed. I don't want to be killed and assaulted. If they need religion for that to not assault me and rob me, then great. You know, but at some point, maybe Freud says, we'll get to a point where science can replace that and we'll, we'll just be good because we're good. And science will replace our, our theological and religious views. Well, this is already happening in the 14th century. It's happening in the 13th century. But the 14th century, this very specific thing starts to happen with Marsilius of Padua. Um, the Hahn and Weicker in their volume, um, they depict him as a, as a, a Veroist, very much um, following of Averroes in this, in this idea where you kind of hide your true view, right? This re religious dissembling, you hide who you truly are because you're wise, you know the truth, but you want to use this lower level religious truth for political gain. Um, it, that's a contested point. That's very contested. It might be true. Well, we can also read Marsilius, I think, in the context of Christendom that his arguments can also be read in that context. And this brings me to a, another point about church and state relations that we have to keep in mind here. We typically look at the history of Christianity in terms of these battles between churches and states. They do exist, and they become very intense in the Enlightenment period, and right before that, actually, and then, and then beyond into the 19th century and to, to this day. Um, I'm not sure how helpful that is in the earlier centuries, particularly the 14th, the 13th, the 12th. Uh, a friend of mine just came out with a book that I, I highly recommend. It's called The Four Church and States, A Study of the Social Order in the Sacramental Kingdom of St. Louis IX by Andrew Jones. This is a fantastic book. 
and it kind of revolutionizes, I think, how we understand these these church and state relations. And I think that's important because that's going to be the focus of the the bias that I'm going to underscore throughout these webinars is going to be specifically that the church and state relations and the ways in which modern biblical criticism developed over the centuries to support specific political agendas. Okay. And that's why I think Andrew Jones's book is so important because it gives us a window into what's going on in the medieval period, including during Marsilius's time that gets lost. It gets destroyed later on. So what Marsilius wanted to do was he wanted to take away all of the temporal rule of the church and give it over to the princes. Right? Again, in Han and Weicker's read, which I think is very important, that's a secularizing trend. I think Jones would say it's not quite secularizing. This is still within that, that medieval context where you have throne and altar, you have you know, the two spheres, the two swords that are working together, that the king saw themselves in a sense, as vicars of Christ, right? They were in charge of the temporal order, but they were also concerned with spiritual matters like excommunications and things of that nature because they saw themselves as, as trying to keep the peace, right? Why? Because of God. And that the princes of the church, if you will, the clerics, the, the bishops, the pope, they too saw the temporal as very important. They also, right, the vicar of Christ, the pope, so they did not consign themselves to what we would consider spiritual matters, but they also were concerned with temporal matters, right, and court hearings and things of that nature, because they also wanted to keep the peace, right, for the kingdom of God. It's not just in heaven, but it comes down to us through the liturgy, and we participate in it here and now. So it's a very complex picture. So I don't want to make a judgment on Marsilius, but what he wants to do is he wants the laity Right, the baptized laity, specifically the nobles, the princes, those who are in positions of ruler, uh, rule, to orchestrate and administer right, church money, church land, things of that nature. Appointing clerics, appointing you know, the officials of the church, all of those sorts of things. And so his biblical interpretation supported that political Failed political, right? Theological political argument. And that's very important. Okay. He's going to find himself with William of Ockham, actually, literally in the same place because of a controversy that happens. We're not going to be able to cover all of this in the time that remains in this session, but I'm going to begin it now and we'll finish it uh, in the second session tonight. But what happens in this time period is the Franciscan poverty debate. It's a very important debate. A lot of people don't know about it. A lot of debates about papal infallibility started going on at that time. Um, there's a lot, a lot of debates that, that continue into the 19th century were really getting going at that time in the 14th century. What this basically was about was about ownership and use of property. Right? And this plays an important role in Marsilius Zapata's Padua's interpretations of Scripture and in William of Ockham's interpretations of Scripture. And you'll see then how this is going to play a role in later interpretations. I'll try to foreshadow that here then as we get to it later uh next week and, and beyond i'll try to touch base and, and bring us back um but what what happens is the question becomes if i'm a franciscan um you know i take a vow of poverty i don't own anything but i'm a preacher right and i don't just preach because the spirit you know gives me you know inspiration hopefully the holy spirit does and will but God is not going to probably infuse me with knowledge when I can work on my own and learn those things. And sure enough, what do we find Franciscans doing? Reading, studying, right? The great Franciscan preachers, St. Anthony Padua, whose feast is coming up, read and studied. They worked really hard and they prayed. They were holy men of prayer. But they found themselves in a situation where they needed books and lots of books. And books were expensive. And they had to be housed somewhere. So in order to fulfill their vocation, they had to use all of these things. So this big debate came up about ownership. Well, do we own those, these books and these buildings, or are we just using them? And one of the popes said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll own them. That's fine. I'll, it'll be owned by the pope, and, and you can use you just use them to kind of assuage their, their consciences. Just don't, don't, don't get bad out of shape. Don't get scrupulous, okay? It's okay. You're still poor. It's fine. 
Um, and what happened was, as we see, right, with Franciscans, right, how many Franciscans are there? I don't know. How many different types? There's a lot. Um, we see reforming move, movements come up. And so we have these groups that you might call the spiritual Franciscans. They were upset with the, what they call the conventuals, because they said, you know, you're, you're, you're eating lots of steak and a lot, of, a lot of wine and living very comfortably. You know, I mean, this is not what St. Francis envisioned. I don't think this is what Jesus intended on us. And you have books and, and you're writing your name, your name's in them. <laughs> you, know, you don't own it? If it's the Pope's, don't put your name in the. I'm making that up. Obviously, they didn't do that. But I'm trying to give you an idea of what happens. You know, you see, we, we do this all the time. I do this. I shouldn't do this. But we do this, right? We see somebody that we think, you know, shouldn't do that because that's not what a, a holy person would do. Take a vacation? Hmm. Right? You know, wait, should you, you know, you, you're wearing a, that's an expensive sweater you have on there. Right? Um, whatever. And we make judgments about them. And we don't know what's going on. For all we know, that was a gift that was given to them. Maybe their bishop told them to go on that vacation. We have no idea what's going on. We make a judgment. I'm not saying that there was no truth to what the spiritual Franciscans were criticizing the conventionals for. There probably was some, right? And, of course, where is the papacy at this time? In Avignon, France. Very wealthy, luxurious place. Uh, very comfortable. That doesn't mean that they weren't... Um, striving for holiness, but if you look at the history, history of the papacy, the Avignon papacy is not one of its high points. And uh, not only was it not one of its high points, um, what we're going to see after this with the Renaissance popes, with Machiavelli, I mean, I'm not even going to go into the details, it's too scandalous, but if you read this, I don't have it with me, but you should read, a friend of mine, Mike Aquilina, has this great book called uh, Good Pope, Bad Pope, and I find myself recommending this again and again. And the chapters on the bad popes are better than the chapters of the good popes, in my personal opinion. Because what you start to see is, my gosh, some of these popes were really bad. I hope they're not in hell. But my gosh, they were really bad. Um, and the church survived. We're here today. The Holy Spirit worked through them and often brought great saints through that. That's amazing, actually. You should read it. Mike Aquilina, good pope, bad pope. So during this time, the Franciscans were in this huge controversy. Pope John the Twenty Second, not the Twenty Third, but Pope John the Twenty Second becomes Pope in Avignon, France, and uh, he says, "No, no, no, no. I don't own anything. You know, I own what I have. But you use it. You own it. The Vatican does not own all of your books and your. Just deal with it." And this became a problem because the Michael of Cessna, the head of the Franciscans of the Conventuals, was having a struggle. He wanted the spirituals to obey, right? They, are vow, they take a vow of obedience, right? Chastity, in celibacy, poverty, and obedience. And so the spirituals are saying, well, you, you conventuals, poverty. And the conventuals are saying, oh, yeah, well, obey. And so it became this huge, huge ordeal. And John the 22nd said, yeah, yeah, you guys have to obey. And then you guys, you know, poor, fine, but you own it. That became a, a real problem. And so Michael of Cessna ended up getting in conflict with the Pope. Um, there's a lot of history here we could cover. I don't, don't want to lose everybody. I just want to mention one figure, and that is Ludwig of Bavaria. He's very important here because he was one of the figures elected as, right, the emperor, right, for this Germanic realm. But it was a tie. There was no un unanimous election. The electors uh, elected somebody else as well. And so John the Twenty Second said, well, since you guys can't agree, both of you give up the throne, abdicate. And I, will, as Pope, will rule until we can have um, a successor, a replacement that everybody agrees on. All right? And Ludwig wouldn't back down. He said, absolutely not. You stay put in the papal states. I'm sorry, in Avignon. He's, not, he's in Avignon, France. You stay put in Avignon, France, and I'm going to rule. And so this is where uh, Marsilius and Ockham found themselves. They found themselves in the protection of Ludwig of, of Bavaria. Writing works on biblical interpretation in support of Ludwig of Bavaria against Pope John XXII, right? Everybody gets kind of excommunicated. 
um, and they declare Pope John XXII as a heretic. Actually, this is how they use, at the time, the debate, papal infallibility. Your predecessor said that the Franciscans own, do not own the property, but that the popes own the property, the Franciscans use it. Papal infallibility, right? Everything a pope says is infallible. John XXII, you're a heretic because you're contradicting your, your predecessor. So this is kind of an interesting twist on that, that debate. So William of Ockham found himself defending the Franciscans. Why? Because he was a Franciscan in England. So he's defending the Franciscans against John the Twenty Second. So he gets in trouble with John, Pope John. So he goes to Ludwig of Bavaria for protection, and that's where he and, and Marsilius of Padua are working together. And so they write all these works that deal very much with biblical interpretation. Marsilius may have been sincere. I think Occam was. We, I think we could give that to him. He's a Franciscan. He, he's probably sincere. He really has a concern for the spiritual poverty debate, right, with the Franciscans. And what happens is this, two things. One, Marsilius starts to articulate not only that the, uh, that the clergy in the church should not have property at all, even if they're secular clerics, no property, no money, all of those administrative decisions, all of those financial decisions should be in the hands of state rulers, right, lay rulers, like Ludwig of Bavaria. But that started to include biblical interpretation. And this is where Occam becomes really important, I think. There's a lot of, a lot of things he does. Right? He's important for the nominalist movement, right, which is the, we might call it name-ism, right? There's no universals. There's no sheep. There's just that one and that one and that one, right? And so nominalism, his, this philosophy becomes very important. But I want to argue something else, again, following Hahn and Weicker, and that is his shift of focus from the interpretive authority. It moves. It's no longer the magisterium, right? And this is pretty important when you think about it, because all of the great biblical interpreters submitted their interpretations, their judgments, to the Pope, to the bishops, to the ecumenical councils. Occam wanted to argue that no, 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 no. The expert, the specialist, we could say the biblical scholar, is the ultimate authority for interpretation. Right? You can see how this is going to carry through, and it does. Occam becomes very influential. Marsilius does as well. But Occam, in more ways than one, especially as you'll see if we can finish that today, um, with Luther, because Luther saw Occam as his main intellectual teacher, if you will. He said, Occam was my master. And so in many ways, Luther was a nominalist. And he never left that. That's pretty important. So when we get to his work in scripture, you will see the hand of William of Occam, maybe even Barcelius of Padua as well. So Occam becomes very important. The shift now is that the expert of scripture trumps the pope, trumps the bishops, right? the expert in scripture, the specialist, that is the highest authority. That's who we should follow, their interpretations. All right? That's going to continue. That, that ends up being one of the early forms, if you will, one of the early methods, kind of first assumptions that you find that kind of moves forward into what we might say is the secularization of biblical interpretation. It's that removal of this idea of an authoritative interpretive body, the church, who is not simply interpreting based on skill, okay, but by the Holy Spirit, right? If, if the Bible is inspired by God through the Holy Spirit, doesn't it make sense that the authoritative interpreters, right, the bishops in communion with the Pope throughout time, the magisterium, guided by that same Holy Spirit, would be the ones to properly interpret Scripture if there's a matter that needs to be settled? So although Occam and Marsilius probably would both agree, Bible is inspired by God, if you had asked him, I think he would have said, yeah, yeah, the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture, of course. Does the Holy Spirit inspire the church? Sure, I think he would agree on that. What his assumption does is it starts to sow the seeds of doubt, at least potentially, right? It starts to sow the seeds of doubt. Okay, so that, so that if a modern biblical scholar who does not believe that the Bible is inspired by God, were to read Occam on this question of the experts, right? 
the modern skeptical Bible scholar would say, oh, wow, he's before his time. This is great. Of course. It's the experts. It's the specialists. Wow. And if he were to see Occam <coughs> accord the Bible with divine inspiration, he'd probably scratch his head and say, well, he's just not being consistent. And I think that becomes the issue. Is what ends up happening is some of these methods, these ideas that they have, they have consequences. Ideas have consequences. And what happens is later generations start to see the logic of those positions, and that's where they move. Right? If it's the experts that are the essential ones to determine what a text means, and maybe it's just a human text like any other. Okay, and we're going to see that as we walk through this history. All right. So I want to I want to move a little bit forward. Um, and a little bit of time remains before the break. What I'll do is I'll just talk briefly about um, some of the role of some other heresies that are cropping up in between um, William of Ockham and the Reformation. And the first big one is with John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, so we'll just finish it up right now before the break. And that is um, perfect. That that is. Uh, that Wycliffe, who he actually disagreed with Occam philosophically, but you start to read with John Wycliffe, is, these are kind of forerunners of the Reformation. So a lot of times Protestants will look to uh, Jan Hus and John Wycliffe as early reformers, right? They'd say the Reformation didn't begin with, with Luther, it began earlier uh, with, with, with Hus and Wycliffe. And what you start to see, I think, there's a lot of things you start to see. They desacramentalize the church. The Eucharist starts to become um, more of a symbol and less of uh, a symbol that does what, it's, what symbolizes less of a sacrament. <coughs> but the thing I think is important is that Wycliffe specifically, in England, which will be very important later, not just with the English Reformation, but in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. In England, what Wycliffe does is he does something similar to a combination, basically, of Marsilius and Occam. It is experts. It is experts who determine what the Bible means, right? But those experts are among the laity, not priests, and they are appointed by, in a sense, the rulers, the secular, if you will, lay rulers of the church, right? That's what's going on. So again, it's, and again, the reason for this, I think Wycliffe is sincere unlike Machiavelli, perhaps. Wycliffe, I think, is sincere because he's seeing corruption in the church. He's seeing bad priests. He's seeing lay people, part of these sodalities, these guilds, that are sinful. Right? He's seeing this, and it's causing him problems. He's seeing a papacy that is not full of saints. We've done really well. You guys don't, may, not, may not appreciate this, but since at least Gregory the Sixteenth, I mean, we've had just amazing popes. I personally think every one of them could be canonized, and they're amazing. We can debate that, but I think they're amazing. You know, Gregory the Sixteenth, right? Pius the Ninth. They're amazing. Leo the Thirteenth. All of them, all the way on up. Um, they didn't have that. They had some mediocre popes and some very, very explicitly sinful popes. At least objectively, committing very scandalous sins, breaking lots of comm ten commandments, very explicitly. Not talking interiorly. I mean, just very explicitly, very bad stuff. Um, and that's what he saw. And so he thought, well, this is crazy. We need the laity to come in and reform the church, reform the clergy. And we have saints who did that. But this is not what they're doing. And the biblical interpretation that comes out of all of this, right, that is focused on the specialist against the church, all of it is ordered, all of it is ordered towards these kind of political moves. Okay? So we're, about, we're approximately about the time for the break. So this might be a good time to break and transition before we get to Machiavelli in the next section. All right, so just to recap where we've been. We, we've talked a little bit about uh, Pope Benedict's biblical interpretation and crisis, that, that lecture he gave. And by the way, if you don't, um, I, have, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Obviously, I don't see all 176 of you. Um, but that was published in its full form in this wonderful volume, God's Word. Where I'm teaching uh, the biblical theology of Pope Benedict XVI pretty soon, so I have this right here. This is an excellent resource. Uh, it's got a couple essays that he wrote that are just fantastic. He's probably my favorite theologian, and was so even before he became Pope. Some of his works helped me in my conversion. Um, but he has it here, 
And in the in initial English address he gave in New York City, 1988, uh, was actually abbreviated, it was uh, slightly shorter than the full German text. And so this is got the entire English translation of the full German text. It's just really marvelous in God's word. We talked a little bit about that, which I see is like the marching orders for my work as a scholar, actually, the biblical interpretation crisis, trying to respond to that so that the exegesis can be theological again. And then we, we talked a little bit about um, the senses of Scripture, how Scripture is important for our lives. And we moved to the beginning stages of the history of the decomposition of that, right? and the history with Marsilius of Padua, William of Ockham, right, and, uh, and then John Wycliffe and, and the Hussites. And just to recap, the, kind of the, the most important, I think, takeaways from that are, initi- are the, the seat of authority, right? who has authority to interpret and what's coming out of that, of that time period with these figures, are basically state-appointed specialists. I mean, it's not quite state. They wouldn't call themselves state-appointed. Machiavelli becomes the person that first uses state in that sense. But, um, but that's basically, you know, court-appointed theologians. And Wycliffe explicitly argued for court-appointed theologians. That's what he wanted to be. That's what he was for a time. That becomes the argument. This is going to continue through to today. And what you're going to see, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries in Germany, is that the scholars at the universities are, to this day, right, state-appointed civil servants. And so then things get really muddied in that time period. But the roots are already here. They're already here. Um, when we get to the 17th century, which is not going to be today, probably going to be next week, um, you're gonna, I'm going to actually dip even earlier before Averroes for a little bit because you, what you're going to start to see is early skepticism coming to full force in the 17th century, just before the Enlightenment. That's not really the issue for Marsilius and Occam and Wycliffe and Huss. They're not skeptics. Um, Machiavelli, maybe. Um, but that's going to really become an issue after the Reformation. So let's move ahead. Let's talk about Machiavelli. Okay, Machiavelli was born in 1469, right? So Occam is dead. Marsilius of Padua is dead. He's born in 1469. He dies in 1527, right? So if you've already been uh, studying about the Reformation, the Protestant Revolution, as Father called it, right? Um, you'll recognize that in 1527, right, the Reformation had already begun. Luther had already nailed his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg, right? That it was already done, right? Luther was born in 1483. So Machiavelli, 69 to 79, Machiavelli was a teen. He was a teenager when Luther was born. So Machiavelli is born in, in what now we call Italy, before it was these, you know, various states. And uh, the big problem, I think, with Machiavelli is his context is a real low point for the papacy. If it was bad in the Avignon papacy, you know, they saw Marsilius and Ockham experienced nothing. Machiavelli's times took the papacy to new lows. Or it might not have been as bad as with uh, Pope Benedict the Ninth, who you'll have to read about. I'm not going to share. Uh, I don't want to scandalize people. But... Um, But it was pretty bad. What Machiavelli saw was pretty bad. And so Machiavelli, it wasn't just, and it wasn't just the popes, it was the bishops. So he saw bishops that were at least involved. They may not have willed the murder, the brutal murder of these, what we might call crime families. I mean, there's all these political families that were warring with each other, very much like organized crime. And they did criminal activities. uh, And they were pretty brutal. And there were... Bishops involved, maybe not knowingly involved in the murder. It's difficult to say. But it was definitely scandalous for Machiavelli. And I think and as a child, he would have seen he would have seen um, dismembered bodies. Like you think about ISIS coming in and wiping out uh, people in the Middle East and what's going on now um, with Christians. Well, Machiavelli would have seen this with, uh, with the warring political families in Italy as a kid, almost certainly, because he was living where this whole town was just it was wiped out. It was, it was brutal. It's gruesome. The, the details when you read about this are, are 
quite graphic and gruesome. Arms and limbs everywhere. So he saw, and he saw the church's role in this, at least in the person of priests and bishops and popes. And so he became scandalized. What he saw was pretty clear hypocrisy, right? Which, you know, we're all hypocrites, most of us. I'm a hypocrite, right? That's why I go to confession. We're hypocrites, so we have to begin again. But he didn't see it beginning again. He just saw continued hypocrisy. Maybe they were going to confession. Maybe they were living lives of joyful penance. I don't know. But it was pretty ugly stuff. And that's what he saw, that exterior. And I think this is important, is we can't, we cannot, we must not underestimate the destructive and harmful effects that our, our public sins do, especially those in, those representative of the tradition, right? So, you know, I don't necessarily represent the Catholic tradition explicitly everywhere I go. I dress like this. People aren't going to say, oh, he's a Catholic, right? They might on Ash Wednesday, you know, if they, if they introduce myself and they find out I'm a Catholic theologian, okay, then they know. But priests, right, bishops, the religious, um, public scandal does that. It's scandalous. It causes people to sin. And it's really, I remember, this is not Machiavelli, but I remember somebody coming up to me asking me how I could be, a, how could I convert to Catholicism and then remain Catholic in light of scandals? And I, I scratched my head and I said, I, what do you mean? You know, it's true, you know, right? Uh, original sin is true too, and that we sin is true. And, you know, I mean, Pope Francis, we all saw, go to confession quite publicly. That Part of what that means is he's confessing sins, or at least flaws, right? And that's, um, that's a beautiful thing. But not beautiful is what sin does, even the most private hidden sins. But the public ones become an issue because they they become obstacles to what? To people following God, for, to people seeking the sacraments. What do I want to go to confession? When he goes to confession, then he goes out and does this, that, and the other thing. That's what's going to happen to me. If I go to confession, I don't need that. right? We need to catechize people. We need to help them. And we need to listen. And we need to understand when things bad happen to them. We need to say, yeah, I'm sorry for that. That's, that's really That's really bad. Machiavelli didn't have anyone to turn to. He just had these bad models of church leaders. And so what did he do? He said, well, that's what religion is. Hypocrisy, right? The leaders he saw, the bishops and the popes, were hypocrites, but they were hypocrites for political purposes. And Machiavelli said, well, that's a good thing. Right? So the prince, he wrote his famous work, book, The Prince. There are a lot of works that are very important, but The Prince is probably his most famous. And he saw the prince as a dissembler, somebody who, who uh, puts on a face, a, a hypocrite. Right? And they do it for control. And so he saw uh, the popes as, you know, this is the ideal, the ideal prince. I believe it was Alexander the Sixth that he saw as the ideal prince, right? the hypocrite pope, who's a, a really a political figure, um, and that to him was what religion was about. And so, what did he do when he came to Scripture? He read that into the very pages of the Bible, right? Moses is really a prince, and this is important because Machiavelli, in some ways, is the father of modern political thought, modern politics. He's the first person, I think, I think, who starts to use the term state, stato, right, in a, in a kind of a, a generic way, as a term that represents a political body. As a, what I mean by that is before, when you think about a state, states, rulers, they were inseparable from the person, from the family, from the realm. People were unified by their faith, their traditions, by kinship, right, family ties to the king, now all of a sudden it becomes an abstract term, right, which is a, a hallmark of modern politics, right, for better and for worse. It's just, that's what it is. And Machiavelli is instrumental in that. And so his biblical interpretation, right, supported the politics of his day. And he read the politics of his day, or I should say the lessons he was learning from the politics of his day, including from the religious figures. He read those 
as telling him about what's really going on in the pages of Scripture. Right? There's no miracles. Moses isn't really doing miracles. Miracles don't happen, right? There's no miracles going on. What he's doing is something, we're not sure what, to convince the people that they have to follow him. It's not God. Rather, it's Moses. God is not ruling the people. The prince is ruling the people. And so what Machiavelli wanted to do there is he wanted not only set a model for how princes should function, but what he wanted to do was he wanted to show the princes and others what he thought was really going on in the pages of Scripture. So this is really, if you think about it, this is probably one of the earliest examples of what we might call a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? So a hermeneutic of suspicion, Pope Benedict was very big on using these couple different, he had a hermeneutic of suspicion versus a hermeneutic of faith, a hermeneutic of discontinuity or rupture versus a hermeneutic of continuity. And really those two ideas, I think, explain the difference between skeptical biblical interpreters and those who approach scripture with faith and also those who see the ecumenical the recent ecumenical councils right recent historically speaking the recent ecumenical councils from trent to vatican II, right as as examples of rupture and discontinuity right so when you think about it, let me let me explain it for a second because you'll see how this really at least goes back to machiavelli if not if not earlier if you look at the way in which Vatican II is described, Vatican II is often described as a complete separation from what came before. And really, if you think about this, those who there are those who read it that way and say, that's a good thing. And then there are those who read it that way and say, well, that's a bad thing. And both can be problematic. Were there problems at the Council? Were there problems at Vatican I and at Trent? Yeah, certainly, there's always, you know, whenever there's any kind of controversy in the church at high levels or the, you know, the background, but, you know, between councils, I'm always comforted by John Henry Newman's uh, work on the Arians because you start to see that Nicaea didn't take care of everything either. There were all sorts of ugly debates happening behind the scenes at Nicaea, and they didn't end for hundreds of years, hence the, right, the filioque. Uh, clause has to get added in to help us understand, right, the Arianism in Spain. No, the, the Father, this Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? The Son is not subordinate to the Father and his divinity. I mean, it's very important in that sense. That's, that's the idea behind that. Um, there's more to it, but that's it's kind of important. Well, the same thing is going on when we look at Scripture and we look at the councils. So there are people who approach them and they see them as these kind of ruptures and breaks, complete breaks. They don't relate at all. And what Pope Benedict wanted us to say is, see is, no, 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 they do relate. Vatican II, in some ways, comes out of Vatican I. There's more to it than that, but they're continuous, right? Trent as well. Trent leads to Vatican I and Vatican II, okay? As an aside, I would say this as an aside. When I look at those three councils, what I see is the goal, the ultimate goal of, is evangelization, sanctification, Right, the faithful and evangelization. And what are the obstacles? Well, Trent, the obstacle, the big obstacle is you've got all of these baptized Catholics, ordained clergy, professed religious who have left. And they're still under canon law. They've left. It's think about all the anathemas, right? Trent is trying to provide a means of return. You're saying that, well, no, no, it's this. You're saying that, okay, you're right. But here you're, you know, you, you, so they're showing them a means of return. Why? Because they want the faithful to come back. Vatican I, right, Vatican I is going to have the same history that we're going to end with, hopefully, in the third webinar. And that council has a new obstacle. You have modern states that are preventing the Pope, right? They're preventing the Pope from communicating directly with his bishops. They're preventing the faithful in these states from being fed by the shepherd, by the good shepherd. And the notions of faith and reason are playing into this. And all of that context, the political context, the faith and reason for Vatican I, is also playing a, a role in art history in the 19th century. Well, by the time of Vatican II, the context is, is, is different, but the goal is the same. 
evangelization, sanctification. Well, it's the same with Scripture. And so what happens is those who approach the Scriptures with a hermeneutic of suspicion, they start by doubting the text. Okay? I don't think this probably happened. It's a human text like any other. Okay? Machiavelli starts this off in a big way. He's, and it becomes very influential. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how now, and then we'll continue with that today in, in the next session. And he becomes very influential in our context, in the context of the history of biblical interpretation, I would say in two major ways, if not more. The first major way, as hopefully we'll see by, by tonight, maybe not, but hopefully, is in the English Reformation. Right? King Henry VIII sparked the English Reformation, was surrounded by figures who were profoundly influenced by Machiavelli. And of course, Henry's reign mirrored what Machiavelli described, right, in The Prince. Okay, Machiavelli, remember, he, he's alive for the beginning of this. Henry VIII is alive with Machiavelli. Machiavelli they, they, they live at the same time. They overlap. Obviously, Henry lived longer. He lived later. Um, but Machiavelli is still alive when Henry takes the throne. So that's important to kind of keep in mind. The second way, and this will definitely be in the next session, is with Spinoza, okay? One of the important figures that we're going to cover in the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes, Baruch Spinoza, and Father Richard Simon. Spinoza was one of the most insightful readers of Machiavelli. He devoured Machiavelli. It was very important for his own work. And so we'll see that hermeneutic of suspicion come in in Spinoza in a very big and important way um, later. So Machiavelli's work carries this, this earlier material forward with these, these new twists. Now, the other influence on him was, were the Greco-Roman classics. This is, again, the, the Renaissance. So they're reading all of these Greco-Roman works. And, of course, he's reading Polybius, right, and others that are more skeptical of their time. He's reading Greek and Roman historians excuse me, who are challenging, right, the Greek gods. We would agree, well, there are no Greek gods. But what Machiavelli does is he uses that to challenge, not God, but the religious texts. Right? He uses it to challenge the magisterium, the tradition, and the texts that we believe come from God. And that's very important. The other thing to keep in mind with Machiavelli, is that as he's doing this, what Christianity becomes is one religion among other religions. Okay? That's pretty significant as well. Now, in some ways, that's a little anachronistic. We're reading back into the history there. Religion wasn't described. The way we think of religions, we think of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. They would have described it that way. They would have described Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They wouldn't have described them as religions. Religions religions, right, religious, the religious were those who were vowed a part of an order or there was monastic discipline, or as Tom, St. Thomas Aquinas talked about, it was this virtue of duty to God. So Machiavelli and those of his time would not have understood Islam as a religion and Judaism as a religion. But it doesn't change the fact that he saw basically Christianity it's very similar, in a sense, to Islam or Judaism, and one among them, whatever they are, ways of life, ways of following God. Christianity is just one more. And the corollary is very important for him as well, and that is that the Bible is just one more text among other ancient texts. That's going to also have a very long history. Now, let me just say there are some positives to that approach, as well as negatives. I don't want to just remove and throw all that away. We do need to read the Bible in some ways like other ancient texts. <coughs> and it does pretty well when we do that. I don't have them with me here, but there's a number of really important books out there of recent years, mostly coming actually from evangelical Protestant historians, I would say, that have done exactly that. Look at the Bible and say, okay, we're not going to talk about this as the divine word of God. We're going to look at it as a historical text. They don't reference Machiavelli. But they're just looking at this as a historical document. Or they're looking at other historical documents from the time period. And the conclusion they come to is that the Bible is the most historically reliable collection of documents from ancient history. Right? Whenever we have comparable material 
from the time period to compare with the Bible. He does very well. It's incredibly well. And the couple texts I would recommend here, <coughs> one is by Kenneth A. Kitchen. Wish I wish I had it with me. It's, it's actually my my office at school. But Kenneth A. Kitchen. Um, if you look on it online, it'll say K A Kitchen by his initials. And it's called On the Reliability of the Old Testament. And he published this in 2003 from Erdman's. It's fantastic. It's over 600 pages. Um, it's an ambitious book. It's really written for a scholar, but it's very good. And it, it's probably the most comprehensive book out there um, in, you know, common European languages in English, um, showing the historical reliability of the Bible. The other one is very good. It's a much smaller text that many of you might be interested in. It's by Walter Kaiser. And it's called The Old Testament Documents, Are They Reliable and Relevant? And he published that, K-A-I-S-E-R, Walter Kaiser, Walter C. Kaiser Jr. He published that from InterVarsity Press back in 2001. I do have a caveat there, and you have to be careful. The chapter on the canonization process is very bad. But he's, again, he's an evangelical Protestant. So you just have to read these things recognizing these are Protestants. They're coming from a Protestant perspective. They don't agree with the Catholic Church. But they're very good when they're looking at historical matters. Machiavelli wants to look at this as a historical text, let's do it, okay? And what you start to see is, wow, this fits, you know, the Exodus fits the Egyptian context. How did that happen? Maybe it, because there was an Exodus. And oh my gosh, you know, first and second kings say that this king ruled here and did this in Samaria. And and look, the, the annals of Tiglath-Pilazar, the Assyrian king, say the same thing. Wow, that's amazing. There are a lot of gold nuggets like that in those volumes that are very, very important. Um, and we can do that for lots of these texts. So there is something to be said for reading the, the Bible like other historical texts. But we have to know the limits. Machiavelli doesn't deal with that, but that's really important. What are the limits? The limits are, this is the word of God. And so what do we do when there's challenges here? I get challenged all the time when I read scripture. I'm like, what does this mean? How does this work? This looks like a contradiction, right? How do we deal with this? We don't need to do an overly, you know, hasty harmonization, the kind of which Machiavelli would make fun of. But we do need to trust the text and harmonize when possible, I would say. And, you know, and what is, what is um, the guy here, I think, is Pope Leo XIII in his 1893 papal encyclical, which is the first biblical and cyclical to come from the popes, called Providentissimus Deus. And what he does is he quotes from St. Augustine, which, by the way, the Second Vatican Council quotes as well in De Verbum, its, its dogmatic constitution and divine revelation. And what St. Augustine says is, is very healthy and holy. And that is that if I see a problem in the text, what's my, what's my response? My first response is to have a hermeneutic of suspicion with myself, right? He doesn't use that, but, but that's really what it is. Yeah, hermeneutic of suspicion, that's right, amen, with myself. I need to doubt myself. I am not all-knowing, okay? Maybe I know Greek, you know, maybe somebody knows it better, but that's not our native language. Even if Greek is your native language, it's not the Greek of St. Paul, right? Um, or the Greek of the translator of Isaiah into Greek. If, you know, same thing we could do, say, with Hebrew. And so you doubt yourself. And what does St. Augustine say? Maybe there's a translation issue, right? Maybe, maybe the issue is with the text as it's been handed down by scribes, all right? Maybe there's an issue there. Maybe I simply do not know enough about the background of the time. I just don't have enough knowledge, right? Again, those, those are very sane and health, healthy and helpful and holy positions to start from. They're not the position that a lot of modern scholars begin from. They're certainly not Machiavelli's position. And their position is a hermeneutic of suspicion. You know, I know the text for Machiavelli. I know Latin. I write in Latin. That's the text he was reading. It was in Latin. For the modern scholar, I know Greek. I had to grind through Greek for... Eight years in Hebrew. I studied Hebrew with this great Hebrew pedagogue, and I, I can speak Hebrew. That's great. But that doesn't get you right at, at the level of, of what's going on in the text. And I think what, what happens is scholars are too quick to dismiss. 
I looks like there's a problem there. Well, I have some kind of account for why there's a problem there. They obviously made a mistake, right? Well, it's much harder to say, well, you know what? I trust the text. There's got to be an explanation for this. Maybe I won't ever figure it out. And what happens then is really interesting. And that's what scholars like St. Thomas Aquinas did and St. Augustine. St. Augustine was aware, by the way, St. Augustine was aware of different traditions of the text, right, of different manuscripts. Now, how's that possible if he didn't really read Hebrew or Greek much? He read Latin. Well, when he commented on Isaiah, this is St. Augustine we're talking about in the 4th and 5th century. When he commented on the book of Isaiah, he was aware of two different Latin traditions, the Old Latin and St. Jerome's Latin. They're a little different at points. And what he said is they must be based on different Hebrew manuscripts, which is probably correct. So what does he do? So he says, okay, I'm going to try to incorporate this into my theology, not doubting the text, but recognizing I don't have an infallible interpretation myself as reader, and, and having a position of humility there. That's what modern scholars don't tend to want to do, but that's important. So there's an antidote to Machiavelli, and that is faith, right? Faith, the supernatural virtue. I believe God, right? And I believe what God tells me. So that's a good, important, kind of an important um, aspect to consider with Machiavelli. There's a lot more we could say about Machiavelli, but I want to move on just to kind of keep us going with, with the tradition. So let's, again, let's just keep us tracking forward. We've got this idea of the focus on the specialist, this idea of the uh, state-appointed interpreter. And I'll go back and forward, even with Averroes, because that's going to come up again, too, the idea that the really specialist, the specialist, the philosopher, the one who's wise in the ways of this world, knows what's really going on, okay, with Averroes. And then with Machiavelli, start from a position of doubt with the text. Read the text like any other human text. Why? Because what's going on in there are not the acts of God, Rather, we're seeing the political machinations of these political rulers, like Moses, King David, Solomon, perhaps even the apostles. That's important to keep in mind, and that's going to play a, a huge role later on. Um, even if it's not explicit, I mean, I think what's going to happen later on is the, um, the modern Bible scholars are not going to go back to Machiavelli. They're not going to say, well, as that genius Machiavelli said, right? No, they're going to go back to their teachers and their teachers' teachers, right? And in the 18th century, they're going to, people will go back to Spinoza, right? Or Father Richard Simon, or, they, or they'll go to others. They're going to distance themselves from them, but do the exact same thing. No, I'm not doing what Spinoza did and then do exactly what Spinoza did, more or less. And Spinoza, again, is getting this from Machiavelli, among others. So let's keep moving forward. So the next figure I want to focus on is Martin Luther. We're not going to cover the whole Reformation. You already had a course on that, some of you. Um, but Luther is very important for so many reasons. Many of the other reformers were inspired by Luther. So for, if for no other reason, his inspiration in the Reformation itself is very important. But what Luther did is just is groundbreaking. And again, I think he was completely sincere. Doesn't make him right. But I think he's completely sincere. I don't think Luther is trying to say, well, here's this inspired word of God. Let's tear it apart. Right? Let's doubt, you know, I know Jesus is speaking through the Pope and the bishops, but take that, Jesus. I'm not going to listen to you right now. I'm going to do something else. I think he really thought there were problems. And there was kind of an evolution in his thought. He, wasn't, he was not a systematic thinker. He's very reactionary. He's responding to different situ situations that are coming up. Right, so the Pope is here. You Pope, you're the Antichrist, right? And then Ulrich Zwingli will disagree with him on the Eucharist. It's okay. Well, Zwingli, you're the Antichrist. You know, there's all these uh, ironies that are going on. So Luther's very important. Born in 1483, he dies in 1546. Um, he dies. So he dies before the Council of Trent's decree on the doctrine of justification, which always saddens me a little bit because uh, I don't think Luther would have liked the decree of the Council of Trent on the Doctrine of Justification. However, the anathemas 
in Trent begin, in the, the doctrine of justification, the decree there in Trent, it's really very important. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important that decree is. You should read it. If you haven't read it, go online and read it sometime. The stuff in the sacraments, the decree, and the justification, very important, um, very relevant. The first anathema is a condemnation of Pelagianism. That is, that you, if you believe you can earn your own salvation with works apart from God, let you be anathema. I think Luther would have liked that. And I think he would have liked that the anathemas began with precisely that. But he was dead. So um, he didn't get to live to see that. So there's a lot of tragedies with Luther. This is really important, I think, if we have time to get into the very end of our, our webinar. I'm hoping to end with a modernist controversy. I know you're going to have a whole other thing on the modernism. On modernism so if I don't get to it, great. But um, I, this is going to relate to that. This is very controversial, but I think what you see in the controversy of modernism, right, with figures like Alfred Loazi, who was excommunicated under St. Pius X in 1908, um, really relates to what's going on in the Protestant Reformation. There's this revolution going on, and it happens again in some ways. And I think, again, I think there, there, we can read this sympathetically. We should, at least we should always try to read figures sympathetically out of charity. Um, He's difficult to read, but this is going back. There's a, there's a very good book. I've only seen one book that deals with this. Unfortunately, it's only in Spanish. I don't know. Some of you probably can read Spanish. Some of you probably cannot. There's a book. It's by Ramon Garcia de Arro. And the book is called um, uh, La Historia Teológica del Modernismo. It's published, in, I don't remember, it's 1972. 72 or 1974, so quite a while ago. That's an excellent book. And what he does, what Garcia de Arro does, and it's uh, Garcia, D-E, one word, and then Arro, H-A-R-O. What he does is he connects modernism with the debates of Erasmus and Luther. It's very important, I think. And I don't know anybody else who does that. Um, because something very similar is going on with authority, with the authority issue. And that was Luther's big issue. But he says justification, the indulgences. I don't know if you've read the uh, 95 Theses, but actually the bulk of it is very Catholic. And it's hard to argue against the overall bulk of it. He doesn't want to throw out all the idea, idea of indulgences or the treasury of merit. In fact, there's a book coming out. I don't have, I have a, do I have the card here? I think I have the advertisement somewhere, but I don't have it on hand, maybe next time. That's coming out from a Mayus academic. I believe it's coming out in the fall, might be, the, might be the spring. And it's going to walk through Luther's theology in light of indulgences. And what he argued, what the, what the book argues, I think it's she, what, what the book argues is that Luther's theology, really, to understand it, you have to understand the idea of indulgences and this idea of the treasury of merit, and that becomes the focus, kind of the overarching framework for his theology. That's pretty significant. So that becomes kind of the matchstick, right, of the Reformation and for Luther. Ultimately, though, it comes down to a, a, an issue of authority. Where does the authority reside? Does it reside with the individual believer, spirit-filled believer? If so, everything is game, and that's exactly what happened in the Protestant Reformation. And that's exactly what happened today. That's exactly what happens with so many of my friends, pastors of these independent Bible churches or whatever, and they split over, you know, all sorts of things. And I'm not making light of that because these are really heartfelt splits. That's very painful and people lose jobs and they lose insurance. And it's very difficult for, um, for, for, for these, 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 my friends, but the, it's the exact same splits. If the individual believer is where the buck stops. If I'm the one that's responsible for interpretation, then what do you do? What do you have? Well, you have as many potential interpretations in churches as you do believers, right? At least the Baptists, you have to have three believers. But, I mean, it's, it's just a cacophony of, of Christianity, which is another great scandal, right? That they all may be one, but omnis unum sin. And so this is a problem we have to work on. And I think Luther, this becomes the big issue for Luther, because he ended up arguing just that. 
and then he changed his mind. <laughs> I don't think he actually ever articulates that phrase, sola scriptura, scripture alone. David Steinmetz once said, I only know this from a footnote in Peter Candler's book, Theology, Rhetoric, Man, Deduction. And in the footnote, there's a footnote in there, which is that David Steinmetz told him that actually sola scriptura comes from the 17th century. That phrase is actually not used in the 16th century. What's interesting about that is it's all over the place in Spinoza. It was this Jewish skeptic, not Protestant, never becomes Protestant, um, but it's all over the place in his work. But it does capture what the reformers were doing and what the early Luther was, was doing. And then he changes his mind because he starts to see all of these Protestants splitting off. And so he has this larger catechism and a smaller catechism. He says, no, 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 don't just read the Bible on your own. You have to be trained first in order to read it rightly. And there's an ins insight there, right? But the difference is, and I think this is, this is key, is Luther never claimed that these, the larger, his larger catechism, his smaller catechism, his seminary form, you know, training that he set up, he never claimed any of that was inspired by God, was infallible. We believe that the magisterium of the Catholic Church is. And so we are blessed, not because we believe it, but because it's true. We are blessed with this incredible blessing. I have so many friends that say the catechism alone, this great compendium of doctrine, not the compendium of the catechism, but the catechism itself, which is a compendium, is um, just a wealth for us to help guide us in our reading of Scripture and, and understanding doctrine, the moral life, life of prayer. It's wonderful. So uh, really, we need to really appreciate and treasure that. Luther didn't have that, and he split. He split over this. And this becomes very important and became very successful. And I want to talk about that, and this is going to probably overlap with the 17th century discussion in the next class, in the next uh, seminar, uh, webinar, with the so-called wars of religion, thanks, with the wars of religion. And that is that <clears throat> these regions of Europe were primed, they were ready for revolution. They were ready for it. They were ready for a Luther. Why? They were ready for a Luther because they did not have any means of curbing or slowing down or stopping or cutting off the Pope's authority in their realm. The Pope they were viewing as a prince. And all of this money they saw bleeding out of Germany or the Germanic realms to Rome, to the Papal States. And this is frustrating everybody. Princes, <clears throat> it was frustrating everybody. So I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to mention it now, and I'm going to come back to it in the next webinar because nobody talks about this. Um, Bill Kavanaugh, William Kavanaugh, mentions this in a, in a famous article he wrote in 1995, A Fire Strong Enough to Consume the House, The Wars of Religion, and the Rise of the State, which he, he published in Modern Theology, the journal Modern Theology, 1995. I'm pretty sure you can find PDFs of that online. Um, it's an excellent resource, very challenging read. He did a, another a book-length, more thorough treatment of that called The Myth of Religious Violence, which is which Oxford University Press published in 2009, which is a, another important work. And he mentions this there, and this is important. The Protestant Reformation was only successful in regions that did not already have agreements with Rome limiting, right, the Pope's authority, right? Um, the nations, the regions that remain Catholic, think of France, think of Austria, think of Naples, think of Sicily, we call it Italy now, but there were Naples and Sicily. Those regions, Spain, those regions, all of them, every single one of them, had what is called concordats, there were these formal diplomatic agreements with, with the papal state, with the papacy, limiting the Pope's rule. They were able to limit papal taxes, so they were able to keep more of their money. They also were often able to appoint their own bishops, right? So, I mean, this went on, this went on to the 19th century. So, um, so either what happened was the ruler would appoint a bishop and the Pope had to verify it, or the Pope would suggest a bishop and the ruler had to agree with it. And this plays a long history in the Catholic Church. It's a long 
part of our history that we don't often know a lot about. But when the first Congress of the United States happened, the papal nuncio approached Benjamin Franklin and asked him to ask Congress, you know, how do you want Catholic Episcopal appointments to happen? And so Benjamin Franklin asked Congress, and they said, oh, we don't care. And so Ben Franklin went back to the nuncio and said, uh, they don't really care. And, uh, and they, you know, the Pope probably never met a modern state that didn't care about Episcopal appointments because of how, how that worked in modern Europe. And he said, but, you know, if we did care, John Carroll would be your man. So he'd be the first bishop of the United States. I mean, it is, that's, that's what happened. It's kind of amazing. Um, by the time of the first Vatican Council, 1870, the overwhelming majority of bishops were state appointed, right? So when, when there's this debate about a council of bishops being the final say or the pope, right, that's, that, that council of bishops is no longer just a theological position, as it was really in the early medieval period. There were debates about this. But now it has political overtones. It's a thinly veiled political move to have all of these kind of state increasingly secularized states control the Catholic Church in their realm. That's important to keep in mind. I mean, we go even for the show divine hand of divine providence, because God is working through this whole history we're covering. Right? We now know that something similar was going on with Pope John Paul II as bishop in Krakow, that um, the, the Polish government was able to veto names that were put forward. And, of course, the Soviet Union was... was kind of telling them who they wanted. And the only name they wouldn't veto is Carol Wojtyla. Right? He's a philosopher. He's, a, he's not going to deal with these with communism. He'll leave us alone. You know? God has a sense of humor. And as we study this history, we start to see there's a lot of negatives. And we're kind of walking through some of the negatives now. But there's a lot of positives. I mean, you know, Reformation time period, God is St. Ignatius Loyola, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, right? who we wouldn't have had without St. John of God. I mean, Saint, it's just amazing you know that's not our topic for today so we're going to talk about you know luther and and the negatives that happen but it's important to keep that god-sized vision understanding god has a sense of humor god doesn't lose battles and so he's going to win and it's going to be funny in the end maybe not now when we're going through it um right now it might seem tragic so there's a couple things that happen with luther that i want to underscore there's a couple things he does a lot of, he does a lot but when it comes to scripture he does a lot with scripture there's a couple of points, uh, and maybe we'll, we're not going to get to maybe the English Reformation today, but that's okay. Luther creates a canon within the canon. That's one thing, right? What, that, what I mean by that is the canon of Scripture, what books belong in the Bible? How do we know? Well, Luther was smart enough to know. Well, the Catholic Church determined this, right? And he also didn't think the Holy Spirit guided it. So he believed he had to determine, you know, what, was, what belonged in Scripture and what didn't. But he didn't do it in a very um, easy or understandable way. What he ended up doing was a hi- almost like a hierarchy of, of inspiration. Certain books that would be in the canon were more inspired than others. Right? So Letter to the Romans, Gospel of Matthew, Galatians, First Peter, very important. First Peter. Those are like higher, more inspired than other texts, in a sense. What this does, he doubted, for example, he also doubted the uh, Pauline authorship of Hebrews, which is contested now and was contested in the early church. But he's one of the early modern figures, right, in this time period in the West to do that. And what this does is this initiates this trend that's going to come up later about the authenticity of books. That had already been going on, as we'll see in the 17th century, that had already been going on in the early medieval period. In Islam, Muslims were already doing that with Christian and Jewish scriptures. But now Luther is kind of doing that, and he's doing that as a man of faith, I'm assuming as a man of faith, as a Christian, right? Um, and what that does is that starts to put the burden of, of, you know, what belongs in the Bible, what is the Bible on these individuals. That's kind of another long history that we still deal with now in the classroom and in the scholarly literature. The other thing that Luther does, which I think is, is important to keep in mind, um, is he, he locates the source of authority with himself, as, as we mentioned. And what does this do? It goes from a position where the magisterium is the source of authority, right, to the individual. That's going to continue 
in the uh, later early modern period and into the Enlightenment and into the 19th century with kind of an Occam twist that any individual, the specialist, the scholar, who's trained in the right way, not in Luther's seminary, but at the university, not at any university, but at the Enlightenment University. Not in a theology department, but in a, a biblical studies department. So that's going to have a very important role to play. What ends up happening here, then, is basically he holds a sola scriptura, scripture alone position, even if he doesn't articulate it with those words. That's going to change in the next century and a half to become a reason alone position. It's not the scripture, it's reason. And so what we have to do is we distrust the scripture. We have to dig under the text, like Machiavelli. Right? Luther's different than Machiavelli. He's more influenced by Occam. Right? So he's influenced by Occam. He's got a nominalist position here. But he believes the text. He doesn't think Moses is some political figure. He believes that Moses was picked by God to lead the Israelites out of the Exodus that there were real miracles. God entered in to nature and disrupted the normal ordering of things. <coughs> Excuse me. So he's not, he's not Machiavelli in that sense. But then what happens later is they take it further. The scholars will take it further. Well, if it's just the scripture and not the church, if we have to determine what books belong, who wrote what, should we not use reason? and determine what happened and what didn't happen. What did Jesus really say? Who was Jesus, right? We have the Christ of faith. Let's get at the Jesus of history. That's exactly what starts to happen. And I, I would argue, actually, that what Luther is doing here with the scriptures, this has broad implications for the entire Enlightenment time period, right? Because this hermeneutic, this method of interpretation is not applied to scripture alone, but to the entire world, the entire universe, the human person. So all of known reality gets sifted through this, okay? All of known reality gets sifted through this. So Luther disagrees with Machiavelli that the Bible is a text like any other, but he agrees, right, he agrees that we cannot trust church interpretation and tradition on this matter, that we have to figure out what's going on here. Uh, the last thing, we don't have a lot of time left, so I, I want to end, I want to finish the Luther part up by ending with an important move that he makes. Again, Hahn and Weicker uh, describe this in, in fine detail in their massive chapters, their largest chapter on Luther. Um, and that is that many people, I've been guilty of this myself, focus on Luther's shift to the literal sense alone as the, the big move. That's not the big move. All right. He does argue this. The reformers tend to argue in the literal sense. We don't need the spiritual senses. We don't need typology. And then, of course, they do it. We don't need the moral sense. They do that, too. We don't need anagogy. What ends up happening is their literal sense is a bigger literal sense. It includes typology. It includes a moral sense of applying the text to my life. It includes all of that. But the big move Luther makes, and I think this is important, is he replaces those four, the four senses of Scripture, the two senses and then the three spiritual senses, the, the fourfold sense, the quad, quadruplex senses, with a dialectical approach to the Bible. Like the, he creates dichotomies, right? right? Law versus gospel, right? Old versus new. Promise, fulfillment. That becomes what he does. So he pits the old against the new, the law versus the gospel. And the law is bad. Right? So this becomes, you know, the promise is incomplete. We have to, you know, so all of this stuff, this becomes his method, if you will, for interpreting the scripture. That's significant. Because what ends up happening now is that traditional method of reading the Bible, which we see in Thomas Aquinas and elsewhere, well, that, that's going to die. And it's going to die quickly among Protestants. And it's going to die slowly among Catholics, but it does pretty much die. You're not going to see it as much. Um, and that, I think, is one of the big moves. That's one of the big moves that Luther makes. It's really important that uh, it's too often neglected. Hahn and, and Weicker do a great job of that. It's too often neglected. So 
with his patrimony, what we find is we find a doubt of tradition, a very robust doubt of Catholic tradition and of the magisterium in particular. And Luther's able to do that precisely because he believes that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Right? And if it does so, and I'm a believer with the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to go wrong. And then as he sees that goes wrong, because everybody's disagreeing with him, he tries to rein it in a little bit. And the princes love his view. Why? Because it supports them. They can use his views to further their political ends, cut off ties with Rome. Now they have a theological, an ideological, whatever you want to call it, justification for their politics against the papacy and the papal states. And that's how this survives. It gets basically forced down people's throats. You have a couple people who leave, but most of them are forced out of it. And, and as we'll see, we'll see this with the English Reformation in the next webinar. Um, Catholics get crushed. They absolutely get crushed. So within a few generations, it starts to get stomped out. So you just have these pockets that are surviving, uh, hidden basically in the, in the, uh, in the catacombs. But I think we're almost off uh, for time. So that's a good place to end. We'll continue with the English Reformation in the next webinar and move into the 17th century. Another one from Linda. It's, uh, it's tangential, but it's related to the topic tonight. Um, basically, she asks, could you, um, she's looking for how do we uh, uh, answer the documentary hypothesis, basically. Oh. <laughs> now, this could be another whole webinar this series. Be, yeah, you just, you just uh, <laughs> oh, we can't do that in the time. I'll, I'll give you some comment. But this is like my, this is how I got into this. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to do a five-volume work with John Bergsma on this. I said it here publicly, so hopefully he, he does it. But um, I can recommend some books, right? So the, the, the short answer is, so the documentary hypothesis, that's how I got into this, because I started to study the ancient Near Eastern scholarship uh, with Ed Yamauchi, and if you look at Kenneth Kitchen and others, you start to see it doesn't fit, right? Multiple names for God. Right, most of the civilizations and single authors wrote for multiple names for God, the um, you know, et, et cetera. And so the question became, well, well, how did that come about? Well, there's a whole political history to that, actually, and we're going to be covering that because we're going to get into Bell House, and you're going to start to see the, the the history of that. The biggest thing I would say is the documentary hypothesis assumes a few things. It assumes, right, that the we can detect authorship based on internal style guides alone. They're fairly arbitrary um, uh, guidelines, number one. And number two, that what's going on in the text, these arbitrary authors or, or communities are at political battles with each other. So the northern kingdom, after it splits with Israel, is against the southern kingdom, etc. It happens very late. And the biggest response, I think, would say is, if this is written by J-E-D-P-H now, you know, right, et cetera, um, long after Moses' time, after Babylon, some of these texts, why is it that it fits the Egyptian context so well from Moses' time within a few hundred years? How would they have figured that material out? And one of the best books on that is Ancient Israel and the Sinai by James Hoffmeyer, which Oxford published in 2005. Another very good one is Israel and Egypt, by, also by Hoffmeyer, um, Oxford. And so what we start to see is as we study the history, it screamingly fits its Egyptian context. And a lot of the telltale signs of multiple authorship have been shown now to be telltale signs of a single author who is very skillfully using right, um, parallels, etc. That's a very short answer, not a very good answer, but that is a whole webinar series. That's a... Uh, We'll have, to, we'll have to have you come back for that one. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Dr. Morrow, in, in, in modern scholarship, is even the document area hypothesis even really, really uh, the forefront anymore? Is, it we... is in textbooks. It's not the forefront. Now that you have uh, a more fragmentary hypothesis, so they, the, most of the scholars who engage in this, most of the scholars who still hold the documentary hypothesis either hold to a J and no E, a P and a D, and they divide P into P and H, or an E with no J, and a D and a P. But the majority of scholars who deal with the Pentateuch would hold to a frag. they just like fragments, little fragments. There is no, no whole documents. Um, but there's an increasing group of scholars, including Joshua Berman, a, a wonderful Jewish scholar, who has really shown that this stuff fits 
the second millennium BC, not the first, right? And he's got a great article where he does this with Hittite treaties from the 14th century BC. He says, why, how can this be this late text from all these different communities when it fits that? And there's more to it than that. I mean, Deuteronomy is, no, is, is Southern. If it's Southern, why is it the central sanctuary in the North? I mean, there's all kinds of problems that a lot of these scholars don't deal with. But yeah, it's in the textbook still, so still taught this way in the classroom. If you want a layman's, a layman's treatment of this whole issue, you can listen to my talk. Not that I'm a layman, but <laughs> my talk on Noah's Flood. And, uh, and uh, you can get a quick review, especially in preparation for the next talk that we have uh, with Dr. Morrow. So uh, uh, Teresa Cotter, who's a dear friend of the Institute, a, a, a member of our board, asks, is there, do you recommend one particular book that would track what you covered in this webinar? <laughs> That's the one. Okay. A little size in the Bible. Um, once we get out of the 17th century, you're gonna have to wait till Scott Hahn and I finish <laughs> the volume that we're, um, we're working on right now. I'm, I'm doing stuff on Velhausen right now. And who's the author of that? What is in the Bible again? Scott Hahn and Benjamin Weicker. Benjamin Weicker and Scott Hahn. What is yeah. in the Bible? Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well. Well. Uh, I think we're good to go for tonight, Doctor, and appreciate your, uh, your great preparation here, and we look forward to next week. And uh, invite our friends here at the Institute to invite your friends to come along with you. Don't keep this gift to yourself. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.